How's it going, everyone? Hope you're all having a fantastic day. My name is Sean, and welcome to the Crazier Frights. At the beginning of the month, we saw the return of everyone's favorite flying, fire-breathing turtle, Gamera, and shortly after, we got the first chapter of a prequel comic. While the series was set in the summer of 1989, the plot of Gamera Rebirth made plenty of references to a super ancient civilization that once existed in the Pacific Ocean, and developed super-powered monsters called Kaiju. These included not only Gamera himself, but all of the monsters he fought against in his quest to defend the children of Japan and the entire world from the likes of Gauss, Jiger, Zegra, Giron, and Virus. This prequel manga, titled Gamera Rebirth Code Thursis, covers the creation of these monsters roughly 100,000 years ago. If you haven't already, be sure to check out my first chapter breakdown on this channel as well. While that one seemed to get a same-day English language translation, Chapter 2 still hasn't gotten its translation yet, even though it came out on the 29th, so without an official translation, I just thought... Fine. I'll do it myself. So, Chapter 2-1 begins in a blood-stained arena with two kaiju squaring off against one another. One of these should be familiar to readers as it is the kaiju deployed by Elistania in the first chapter while the other appears to be a brand new design, a sleek, heavily armored quadruped with shark, wolf, and crocodile-like qualities. As these two monsters duke it out, nobles from one of the city-states of Mu seem to express their disbelief that the Teta House is still using the same kaiju as nearly a decade ago, stating that the opponent has undergone quite a bit of genome editing, while a third asks if there's any chance it could win this match. Our nemesis Phase 2 look-alike roars in defiance against his much more imposing adversary as their ministers from Elistania seem to lament that unlike 10 years ago, they no longer have a monopoly on kaiju production. If you remember in Chapter 1, their creation made short work of a group of soldiers from a rival nation, whereas now the same beast seems to be highly outclassed by its kaiju opponent. Predicting their own defeat before the climax of the battle, they begin discussing how they need to quickly develop new weapons just as their kaiju makes a valiant but ultimately futile attempt to bite his opponent's jugular vein. However, the armor proves too much for Elistania's kaiju to handle, shattering its teeth and leaving it defenseless against its counterattack, which results in a killing blow. The ministers from House Teta discuss that the key to improving their bioweapons may be found in the enlargement of living specimens, and while one asks the other where on earth such research could be found, the other replies Luina adding yet another region to our mental map of Mu. I'm really hoping at some point the creators of the manga or Katakawa themselves give us a map showing where all these locations are in relation to one another as it would greatly help our understanding of some of the events of the story, in my opinion. Meanwhile, back at the meat processing plant slash secret lab, we see that there's a pile of dead rats in a bag, no doubt new additions to the mystery meat blend. Our protagonist Lucius comes into the room after likely working in the lab below, and here I just want to point out quickly that his sister's name, which I had previously pronounced Seika, is apparently pronounced more like Sika. So that will be how I'll be saying it going forward. Anyway, Lucius asks Sika if he can have some of the rats for his research later when their uncle Aldo comes down, evidently surprised that they are still working so late, and tells them that they're overworking and that it's fine to go home once in a while. They take the tram to go home to visit their parents' graves as it's been a while since they last did so when Sika seems surprised that Lucius has brought his research with him and continues to work as diligently as he had in the lab previously. She scolds him for continuing to work away from the plant to which he assures her that he needs only a little more time. The tram arrives near the grave and Sika goes to buy flowers but becomes worried when she can't find Lucius anywhere. She calls out to her older brother, but when she doesn't get a reply, she goes looking for him, where she discovers that he's meeting with two mysterious men in black robes, one of whom says to Lucius that he will look forward to his reply. Sika makes the observation that the men's black clothes imply that they are members of a group of aristocracy known in Japanese as Kizokuin. This is interesting as it translates to the House of Peers, which was a branch of the Japanese Diet or Parliament that roughly correlates to Britain's House of Lords that was active between 1889 and 1947. Members of this branch of government were not directly elected, but rather appointed to their posts by the Emperor of Japan, which gives us more insight to the type of aristocratic rule found in this nation. This surprises her as her brother is supposed to be fighting the good fight against the nobles, as we found out in the first chapter, so this adds an extra layer of depth to his character. Eventually, Lucius turns up at the grave and apologizes for keeping his sister waiting. She tells him it's alright, but asks what he was doing, to which he simply replies nothing. 
dismissing her completely. We also get a glimpse of the writing system used in the ancient continent, which seems to be an entirely fictitious script as far as I know, as opposed to the writing system of Mu or Atlantis seen in the Heisei Gamera trilogy, which utilizes actual runes for its text. Back home, Sika notices that Lucius is again hard at work on his research and asks him if he can't do that type of work at the plant, to which he replies, to be honest, the equipment there is a mess, so... If he doesn't do some of the work from home, he'll never be able to complete it. She asks if there's anything she can do to help, but he simply tells her thanks, but he wonders if it's too difficult for her to understand. She responds, oh right, because I'm a moron. Definitely sensing a bit of animosity here, and Sika seems to be tired of being kept out of the loop and treated like a child by her brother, who seems to be too busy with his research to even notice her. Back at the plant, Sika's thoughts are again occupied with the fact that she doesn't seem to know what her brother is thinking anymore, and how that worries her, as he seems to be growing increasingly distant. Distracted by these intrusive thoughts, she breaks yet another knife, and the next panel shows her profusely apologizing to her uncle, who scolds her, saying, What are you thinking? How many has it been this month? Again, leading me to question the metal quality of this country, since a knife really shouldn't be that easy to break. While his sister gets yelled at, one of the researchers calls out to Lucius, asking if he's there. Immediately arrives at the lab, where another researcher questions him about one of the specimens, namely subject C198, which we see as apparently mutated considerably with large tusks protruding from his mouth. Lucius replies that after 190 he began changing the dosage of a drug called Megalolict, but that he never dreamed it would be this effective as the next panel shows that subject C198 has apparently broken through his containment device and slaughtered the other test subjects in his enclosure. Lucius notes that this specimen shows a much higher degree of intelligence than previous experiments, which shocks the other researcher. The chapter closes with Sika laying in bed thinking about the time she was at the grave seeing Lucius take an envelope of some sort from the members of the House of Peers and she's unable to sleep. She leaves her room and decides to go for a walk while thinking about what it could mean as well as what her role is and that's it for chapter two. I'm still really enjoying this storyline which as I mentioned previously is giving me major Resident Evil vibes. I'm definitely invested enough to keep going even if I wasn't making these videos covering it and want to learn more about this lost continent and see how the story progresses further. The next issue is scheduled for October 13th so if you enjoyed this breakdown be sure to come back here for another one sometime shortly after that date. And also give this video a thumbs up and consider subscribing for more content like this in the future as it would be greatly appreciated. Hope you have a safe and wonderful day and as always, thanks for watching.